Hank uh, Willis Thomas is a photo conceptual artist working primarily uh, in themes related to identity, history, popular culture, masculinity, uh, violence, and I would add justice. Uh, he received his BFA from uh, New York University's Tisch School and an MFA in photography also from Tisch. And if two degrees were not enough, he went on to earn his MA in visual criticism uh, from the California College of the Arts. He has been a visiting professor at CCA and at Maryland Institute College of Art as well as Bard College. He's lectured at Yale and Princeton and the Birmingham Museum of Art and Musée de Quay, uh, Branley in Paris, he is, his work has been featured in numerous publications. His own monograph, which some of you may be familiar with, Pitch Blackness, was published by Aperture in 2008 to great acclaim. He's been a fellow uh, or artist in residence at the Tribeca Film Institute, Johns Hopkins University, and the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute at Harvard. He has exhibited in galleries and museums throughout the world including the Anaruma 404 in Milan, the Studio Museum of Harlem, the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco, among many others. Thomas's work is in numerous public collections, including the Museum of uh, Modern Art, the Guggenheim, the Whitney, the Brooklyn Museum, the High Museum, and the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston. His collaborative projects, and collaboration is very important in his work, and I'm going to ask him a question about that later, because I, I love that about, um, about his approach to his, to his art. Um, his collaborative projects have been featured at the Sundance Film Festival, the Oakland Museum, the Cleveland Museum of Art, the, uh, the Corcoran, and the International Center uh, for Photography, as well as the Istanbul uh, Biennial. Personally, I would just like to welcome uh, Hank to Chicago. Um, I'm familiar with your mother's work and very um, impressed and excited to have seen your collaboration with her. Um, and it was really a pleasure to get to know your work and I look forward to our conversation. So join me in welcoming uh, Hank Willis Thomas. First time for everything, and this is the first time I went to the wrong building. I walked around aimlessly for uh, 30 minutes before my talk. Um, so I apologize uh, for being late, but I'm going to make up for it real, real fast. Um, can somebody like light the air in here? You were like talking. Like, let's talk. Um, so yeah, it's just it's really great to be here. I'm excited. I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity, um, and. This is going to be kind of an, orth an orthodox way of speaking because um, things got confused for me. <laughs> um, but I'm going to start with, um, I guess I'll start here, which is kind of a weird place to start. Uh, this is a piece called All Things Considered, uh, All Things Being Equal, which was a place, a show, from a show that I did in South Africa in 2009, um, 10 actually. And it was my first time exhibiting in South Africa. And, South Africa has been, as we know, um, going through a lot of changes in the past two decades, um, but also really fascinated with how, um, as uh, equality kind of supposedly has come politically, we see a lot of disparities through um, economics. Um, and I'm really amazed by the way that kind of some of the same systems of, of racial separation during apartheid are kind of transitioning through economic. Uh, separation or segregation afterwards. Um, and, I, and I'm starting, when I say it's weird, it's because I'm starting like way, way, way back. This is work I started, I did when I was in graduate school, in undergrad. And I've said all my work is really about framing and context and how whoever's holding the frame has the ability to make the picture. Because I think we kind of take photographs so often as documents, but we forget that every photograph is a manipulation. And it's, also, it's always about one, very, it's a very narrow um, you know, uh, focal, angle of focus, split second of time with no dimensionality and um, no sense of smell, no sense of sound. And I, I realized how much I, I think photography has been used as a historical document, which in a lot of ways it couldn't be further from the truth. And in images like this, where it's, it's like pure chance, where this is my mother on the left wearing this red hat, 
in the project, basically, I would go around with friends, like give people a frame and ask them to take a picture. And I'd take a picture of them taking a picture. And in the 30th of a second that I took the picture, someone walking down the busy street in New York walks into the frame of my mom's holding the camera wearing a, you know, a red hat, <laughs> looks into a dark restaurant at that split second that someone's taking a picture. Because, and what I think that, for me, that I spend a lot of money in, in school talking about <laughs> meaning in photographs, and it speaks to how much chance really falls into like all the stuff that we try to uh, bring meaning to and we, we kind of try to decode photographs, and also our, our selective vision. Uh, and there's a quote by Carl Hancock Rux um, in a book called Everything But the Burden um, that I, I, I always like to, to use. He says, there's something called black in America, there's something called white in America, and I know them when I see them, but I will forever be unable to explain the meaning of them because they're not real, even though they have a very real place in my daily way of seeing, a fundamental relationship to my ever-evolving understanding of history, and a critical place in my relationship to humanity. Uh, I I'd sometimes say if I could ever, if I could plagiarize an, an artist statement, this would be it. Uh, because when I was in South Africa, now a little bit over a decade ago for the first time, uh, it was the first time I realized that race is, it's a, it's a joke that's played on all of us. Um, in that what the designation of black in South Africa is different from the designation of black in the United States, which is different from the designation of black in England. Those are the in, in, I don't know, even in, in France and Belgium, and I was like, if they can't agree on what blackness is in all of these different places, could it possibly be real? And, and I started to really question the validity of kind of these, these, these languages and systems for, for codifying us. But also thinking about how photography plays into our perception, especially with the United States, of, um, of, of identity. So how many people know who this person is? Does anybody know, want to guess what this person did? This was one of the most famous people in the world of his time. I'm thinking maybe that's the guy that was uh, doing blackface a long time ago, but they didn't know his identity or something? Yes, Burt Williams. Um, um, and what I found so fascinating about that is seeing how he was celebrated for performing blackness um, by mainstream America and the way that he celebrated and performed blackness in his own life. And that, that, that disparity in him becoming one of the first millionaires as a, as a performer really says a lot about kind of like, this is a black man dressing up to be black and being paid well for that. Uh, and we can probably think of a lot of people who do that today. Um, and then I, I also, I sometimes think of myself as a visual culture archaeologist because when I realize that there's more photographs taken in a single second than any of us can make sense of in our entire lives, I started realizing that maybe some my job could be being the son of a curator and a photo historian to actually look at photographs as a way to, to make art um, and existing photographs. And, and I was doing an exhibition at uh, a museum in, in Hartford at Wadsworth Athenaeum and I came across this postcard and I, long story, I, mean, I framed it and did all this other stuff. But I realized whenever you put a frame around a picture, it, ch it changes the meaning of it. But this is a picture from the rural south in, 19, in the 1900s. He's wearing a World War I soldier's hat. Um, he's got uh, a rifle in his hand. He's wearing his Sunday's best. And this is a, an image that's in stark contrast to most of the images that I'd seen of black people or heard about black people basically prior to 1950. <laughs> um, um, even though, you know, I can talk about, you know, outside of my mom being a curator. 30 books about black photographers and that stuff. But I really, for me, what was most fascinating about that was when I, I looked at the postcard and I turned it over, and this was all that was written on the back of it. Remember me. And it, it almost felt like it was like a message to the future. That like, because when we think about, when I talk about the, how pictures and history being so limiting and telling, you know, uh, a very narrow story, you know, this, this grand narrative, there's so many other stories that we're neglecting. So if we only carry this one story, how many millions are we kind of, that are equally important are we neglecting? So uh, my father, I'm gonna digress, because I need to loosen up. But um, my father was like talking about, I was like, when I grew up in, he grew up in the segregated South, and one time my uh, dentist, my dentist, <laughs> so I was like, man, uh, your father was the first black person to bag groceries at the AMP in Florence, South Carolina. So we used to just sit outside and slap him five. Like, You're a dentist. 
you know, to think about in the span of their lifetimes, they went from it being a big deal for somebody to be able to bag groceries to being a dentist, and my father became a physicist. But this other day, he was like telling me about how when he was growing up, black, a black person in South couldn't look a white person in the eye. And I was like, was, you know, so did you not look a white person in the eye? He's like, of course I looked at people in the eye. And I was like, wait, you just told me that a black person couldn't do that. But then again, you never played by those rules. Your mother never played by those rules. Your father never played by those rules. And so how does that complicate the story that, that, we're, that we're used to being told? And I'm always really interested in kind of how stories that we're very used to change. You know, we had these kind of amazing kind of flipping of the scripts, you know, where there was this great white hope that was like supposed to come back for a century to like reaffirm white males' dominance and physical prowess. And when, when they did come, like almost exactly at the same time as the, the black hope came, um, no one cared because it kind of starts to, to break away all the, 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 the myths that we kind of have built our, our social structure on. And thinking about that, um, I was really fascinated with um, how um, Michael Jordan went from being a born in the segregated South to being a transnational, transracial figure, um, primarily through his talent of putting a ball through the hoop. And how for he Nike went from a ten million dollar company when he started to a ten billion dollar company when he took, when he retired, and so many other transnational corporations grew their brand based off of his legacy. But also thinking about how someone of his stature would have been treated at a different period of time reminds me of this quote of Stanley Crouch, where he says, "1960, if white girls in the suburbs had a poster of a Negro that dark on their wall, there would have been hell to pay." That kind of racial paranoia is not true in the country now. Today you have girls who are Michael Jordan fanatics and their parents don't care. To me that's like astounding that like really in 25 years he could go from being this kind of charge figure to being kind of um, a, a, a completely uh, universal figure. And but also, I, but also thinking about what's happening in sports right now with like Ray Rice and Adrian Peterson, which is very different than what happened with Ben Roethlisberger and um, plenty of other, uh, the way in which uh, black athletes, when they step out of line or do the wrong thing, are, are treated in comparison to their white counterparts, sometimes even in the same sports. Um, and so I was really thinking about how also it's not too far-fetched to think of someone in the NBA or NCAA being related to someone who was lynched. Uh, and so I, I am thinking about how black bodies hanging from the tree then, hanging from the tree now. I started to, I really made a lot of work think, kind of playing with these issues, thinking about logos as our generation's hieroglyphs because they're embedded with such meaning that they, they, they basically move the world. And I've always really realized how I could use and appropriate that language, which is ubiquitous. You don't have to speak actually any language to understand an ad. That's because we've been all conditioned to, to speak that language. And so. Uh, I was thinking about, for instance, with this piece, Absolute Power, how um, the creation of, of blackness, as I see it, through this commercial interest, like 500 years ago in Africa, there were no black people, they were just people, and they had, there's thousands of cultures, thousands of religions, hundreds of millions of people, and many of them did see themselves, most of them did see themselves with having very much in common. Uh, but this notion of blackness really comes about through, you know, uh, Europeans with a commercial interest in dehumanizing this, creating a subhuman brand, packaging people into ships and sending them halfway across the world, and calling uh, this hybrid, diverse group of people the same. I, I say, like, 500 years later, the, the fact that their descendants are still trying to figure out who they are, to me, that's absolute power. But also thinking about how black bodies have been we're, you know, we're uh, branded as a sign of ownership and how today we brand ourselves uh, and how we live in an age of branded consciousness as I advertise for uh, Apple at this moment, that so many of the ways that we identify ourselves is through our relationship to corporations and, and corporate brands and how uh, with this piece, uh, it's called Basketball Chain, thinking about how the idea of ascending for so many people is, is, is chained to ascending through sports and entertainment but also, I know I'm going fast, so just get into the rhythm of it. <laughs> um, 
And this is one of the pieces um, that's actually part of the benchmark projects at, um, that, that Monique Loesch Gallery is doing. And so there's seven benches um, in, uh, is it Wicker Park mm -hmm. neighborhood? Um, um, but that, that they, that they put my work on, 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 on pub, in the public, because it, which is really kind of exciting for me to see work that um, is kind of originated with the ideas of putting it out to the public, but has circulated primarily through galleries and museums. Seeing it back in the public is kind of really exciting. So hopefully you guys will get to see that um, in the next, it's up now, um, while you're waiting for your bus. <laughs> um, but this is a piece that's important to me, actually, actually really thinking about what's happened in, in Chicago with the Northwestern team, the fact that um, college sports is a multi-billion dollar industry that's fueled off of the free labor, primarily of the descendants of slaves. Um, and in the case of Old Miss, where this uniform is from, they're actually on the same fields that their ancestors actually used to work. So this is amazing kind of way in which history repeats itself. But also think about sharecropping, if you don't see that slavery, it's just like, you can live here, <laughs> but it's going to cost you everything you do. Um, and, that, and that's basically how I see college sports. Um, but I, I also think about um, how uh, many times as an African American, I've been asked, like, where do you come from? I'm like, New York. And like, where do you, where about before that? I'm like, Virginia? They're like, well, what about before that? And I'm like, uh, South Carolina? Um, and then uh, they're looking for this place. And so I created this piece called A Place to Call Home, which is Africa, America. Um, so in case you were ever wondering where you came from, <laughs> it's this conceptual place, literally. Um, but I've also done a lot of work thinking about that hybridity that exists within myself and other artists, like Sanford Biggers, who's featured in this image, um, who's, worked, who's lived in Japan and all, in many other places, in Poland, many other places in the world. And thinking about how when we look at someone at, at, at the surface, we only see, we don't see anything about them, really. But we tell ourselves, we're trained from an early age not to judge a book by, we're told not to judge a book by its cover. But then the rest of our lives, we're told to like put on a cover because people are going to judge you by it. And then we judge everybody else that, based off of that. But I'm also really interested in investigating that hybridity exists within me that's not visible. And so, so I do that in a variety of works like this one. Um, and then as a photographer more recently, and I, become, I see myself as, I've, as we talked about a photo conceptual artist, but I've really, you ever like see a picture and you're like, I wonder what it would have been like to be there? Um, that's basically what this series I've been working on more recently is, where I've started to take elements of photographs. This is a protest in 1990 in South Africa where someone was put into a paddy wagon and their gesture in protest as they've already been arrested illegally or against all, all, all logic and may never be seen again is to put their arm through the, the, the breathing hole. Um, as this gesture to, of solidarity to all the people who are still out there. And I think um, that level of courage, in spite of like knowing that someone could, who probably hit you just a second ago, could break your arm, anything is, I, these are these moments, these gestures that I kind of feel like as they're important to bring back and to highlight. And so um, in isolating them, cropping them similar to the way that I, uh, all photographs are cropped is, is one of the things that I've really been kind of digging into. So in all of this work, I've been um, looking at historical moments. This is people burning their past books in South Africa um, during apartheid, this collective gesture of defiance. Um, uh, these miners, this picture by Ernest Cole where uh, miners were being strip searched um, in gold mines because, you know, you can't work for a penny and then pick stuff that's worth hundreds of dollars and be trusted. Um, so the miners have to be stripped every day before and after they go to work to be. Um, and so I'm recropping it and it starts to change, have a different uh, meaning, but also after what happened this summer with Michael Brown, I started to see a different meaning to it. Um, uh, and so, and I'm, I'm just talking fast because I, I wanted to show you guys a lot. And um, there's, uh, this is another piece um, called uh, If the Leader Only Knew, and it's from a show I had in Berlin recently. And I guess because a lot of the, the, the Holocaust deniers in, 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 in Germany 
um, believe that Hitler obviously was infallible and, and that the concentration camps didn't really exist. So whenever people saw um, horrible things happening under Nazi regime, they'd say in German, if the leader only knew. And this is, this is from a picture um, of children whose hands are on barbed wire. Um, and it, it was just really kind of this, for me, when looking at the photograph, this really profound, um, and you know, chest, you know, moment that uh, we see actually um, replicated in, um, in camps all over the world, refugee camps all over the world even today. Um, but also uh, this image is of uh, during uh, the reunification of Germany where someone on the ground is touching someone standing on top of the, the Berlin Wall. And so I've really been fascinating kind of how, how do you can isolate a moment and turn it into three-dimensional space and, and, and tell a totally different story and we imagine the rest of it. Um, and this is the part where I just like go, go haywire trying to talk fast about my project. It's a collaboration called Question Bridge and there's going to be probably sound. No? So Question Bridge is a, is a video mediated megalog between African American men. Uh, that it's a collaboration uh, that with four other artists. It was at the um, the DuSable, um, I think, up until May of this year, and we basically we traveled around the country and we asked African American men, one of whom I see here, uh, Fahim, uh, to ask and answer each other's questions. And the, the the goal of the project was to show that there's as much diversity within any demographic as there is outside of it. One of the most dangerous things for any person, but especially in this country, African American men, is to be grouped into this, this category that was never made to serve us. And I think I have as much in common with him as I do with you and you and you and everyone else. And were, we're all actually as different as that. And we wanted to highlight that through just asking men to ask and answer each other's questions. Um, and this is an example of how I don't think the sound is working. Do you, is the sound working? My Whoa. It's kind of loud. My Should I turn it down? Okay. My question to the black man in America or anywhere else is what is common to all of us that we can say makes us who we are? And so we take a question like that and we'd show it to someone else who we thought could answer it. Our commonality is in our history, um, but I think. Our beauty as black people is also in our diversity. So we traveled the country and we found like a, first 160 African American men. Now we've launched this interactive website that has uh, over um, over 500 men on there now. And I'm looking for some of my favorite questions. I'm just skipping through all this stuff. Go to questionbridge.com um, because I'm getting what's happening. Oh, uh, that's all. We're just going to have to chalk that part up. Um, but um, basically, I, mean, I want to show you one of my favorite um, exchanges in there, because we got basically out of, from the first 160 men, uh, we had um, about um, 160 questions and, and over 1,000 different answers. And each, what we first thought, we'd take the first que the one question, then we take the best answer. And what ultimately wound up happening is we'd have five just different questions for every answer. And it really spoke to this diversity. And like even myself, we'd go someplace like a prison, and we'd think we know what kind of question someone's going to ask or what kind of answer is going to be given. And invariably, we were surprised. But so here's an example of, of one of the guards at the Birmingham Museum of Art where we first started. So one of the very first people that, to participate. You know I wonder, black man. You know I wonder, black man. Are you really ready for freedom? And if not, what will it take for you to want and need this freedom? Um, and we showed it to them on a the laptop, and then this was the immediate answer, like three seconds later. Am I ready for freedom? And what would it take for me to want that freedom? First, I would have to stop and ask myself and 
Oh, that's a good, that's, I mean, that's, that's a tough question. Because freedom to me is a mind state, you know, because you got some people that's not in jail that's not free. You know, you got people that's in prison in dysfunctional relationships. You got people that's in prison with jobs. They work nine to five that they don't like. Some people are in prisons with alcohol and drug abuse. So I would have to, um, I would have had to really ask myself, what's in prison in me? And what's been in prison in me is my self-esteem, my lack of self-esteem. My lack of self-esteem has led me to commit crime, to hurt people, to manipulate people, right? Because if I love myself, there's no way I could walk, around, walk outside this room and punch somebody if I'm esteemed within myself. So to be free to me would have to be, I would have to change. You know, so in order for me to grow, I'd have to change because if change is necessary for growth, in order for me to grow, I would have to adapt the, I would have to adapt the mentality that something has got to change in me. I have to change my mind state. I would have to change the way I talk. I have to change the people I, I interact with. That would be free. And uh, for me, the. the it was just profound to hear, like when I heard the question, are you ready for freedom? It just seemed such like a generic question, but it was really tapping into such an incredible opportunity for this man to express himself in a really authentic and, and I think articulate way. Uh, and so I really encourage you guys to go to the Question Bridge website, explore, we have over 1,500 or 2,000, I don't know yet, um, question and answers, um, and, and growing and, and hopefully encourage other people to to, to, to join the conversation. And I wanted to show you guys two more things, which will take trace minutos. <laughs> um, but, um, but, and I'm just embarrassed, so forgive me. I'm never embarrassed. I usually put my foot in my mouth and feel really good about it. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, I just want to show you these pictures from installation. That's just, so it's like a five channel installation. Um, you get to see like how big how big and how many people were engaged in it, because it was a three-hour conversation, and people sat for 40 minutes at least, but even up to the whole three hours. And so the website, you get to see the questions and the answers. Each person comes on, they tag themselves in as many different ways that they see themselves. And so you don't see this black man as that. He sees himself as five or 10 other things. And so you can search people by that. You can see people geographically. Um, and then you can also follow the conversation. 12% of men uh, were speaking about this in this place. Uh, there's also a mobile app and a website. Um, and then the, the last part I want to show you about, is talk to you about, was my Truth Booth project, which is the next kind of part of that conversation about creating art that allows the public to actually be invested in to make the art. So we created the speech bubble. You walk in, it's, it's a touch screen, it says everyone has their version of the truth, what's yours? Speak for the next two minutes, starting with the truth is. And we travel it to Ireland, these are two of my collaborators. We took it to Afghanistan um, last year. And I just want to show you um, a couple clips from that and then we can go to our conversation, which I'm looking forward to. The truth is not to be discovered because it was there before we were born. It hid itself when we were born, and it only comes out again once we are dead. I'm nearly dead, so the truth will shortly emerge. I believe the truth is the struggle to find what it really is. The truth is really small, it's very hard to see, but if you look really, really close, you will find the truth, and it's all around. Thank you. It is true that I have got a girlfriend that is named Rian, and it is true that my favorite animal is a dolphin, okay? And that's all I wanted to say. The truth is, Molly, you're a bitch. The truth is that I want to be an actor, a dancer, a singer, but I'm not sure how to get into the business. I've joined Trading Faces and well, I've joined the agency of Zare, but I'm not sure if I'm going to get into the, well I am in the agency, I'm not sure if I'm going to get anything out of it. And I just really want to be an actress especially, or maybe a beautician, or a singer maybe, or maybe a dancer, but I'm not sure how to get in. That's the truth.
This was an accident keen production. Let's say hello to Melody because she's my little doggy and all my other pets. And my parents. Peace out. The truth, I believe, is wriggled. Lego with you think small, but believe big. Lego is in all our minds. So the truth is very, very small, but think big. This is very cute. And so cute. ending on that is pretty great for me because this little 12 year old just blew my mind. You know, that the, the, you know, the truth is Legos. <laughs> you know, that, that really the, the truth is in our imagination. And, and so as we've traveled around the country, the world, to, to do that project, we've, and we've had 5,000 people participate in it. And like Question Bridge, I see this as a collaboration with all the people that contribute their voices. And so um, I hope that my, really, my real goal in life is that I stop talking, that other people talk, and I can just listen more and better. Um, and that the work is just a, a, really a, a tool for starting a conversation. So in the, in the, on that note, I hope that we can start our conversation. Thank you. I'm really happy to be having this conversation and I promise you all will have a chance to ask questions um, at the end. So you kind of think about that while we talk. So in a way, it's sort of blasphemy to ask artists to explain their work, because the work explains, you know, does, its, you know, does what it's supposed to do. But you were very eloquent in um, talking about your work, and I enjoyed watching. You did an interview with my friend Mark Anthony Neal okay. years ago, and, and you've done others. So um, I guess, I, and, and tell me if this is an unfair question. I'm a historian, so, and I see, I mean, your hist history is a part of what you deal with in your work. And I always ask the question, my obligations as a historian and an activist in the work that I do, and I'm just wondering how you see your kind of obligation as an artist dealing with very weighty issues of history and politics um, to provoke, to educate, to challenge, to you know, correct um, myths and, and inaccuracies. So, you know, kind of what do you think of as an obligation that you have as, a, as an artist? Or to create new myths and inaccuracies. That, well, um, thin that, line between truth and deception. Right. right? Well, or truth and truth. Because I, 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 that's, that's what I'm really fascinated with is that the fact that the truth is really my truth is different from your truth which is different from your truth and how many times have we gotten to an argument with someone where they said I didn't say that I'm like I know you said that um, or vice versa and that's how history is you know where people tell us this story and then someone else has a totally different understanding of that of that story and I'm really interested in all the other stories because the story that I've been told doesn't really serve me very often or very much Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I think, so the lens that we see history through, I think, is different. And the location that we see it through is different. But I think there are, there are competing understandings of what happened. But there's also, there's also a sort of objective reality of what happened, I think. Maybe that's why I'm not an artist. But <laughs> anyway. Well, anyway. Can, I, can, I, can I tell you where my, my logic comes from? Sure. Because my mother, her name is Deborah Willis, she's a photographer and a photo historian. Um, and uh, she became a photo historian because when she was in undergrad, she was asked, she, well, she was assigned to do an uh, independent research project, and she wanted to do it on black photographers. And the objective truth was there were no black photographers. And they're like, there's Langston, there's, not, there's Gordon Parks, there's Roy de Carava, and that's, that, that's it. And what my mother did is she, uh, one of her professors, this woman named Bar Barbara Blondeau, encouraged her to actually do more research. And she basically, with a couple other people, buried the field of black photography mm -hmm. and found that there were African Americans making photographs as early as 1839, mm -hmm. not just a few dozens that are recorded. And that shifts everything and so what I th my problem with the notion of an objective history is that until we do until we find new mm -hmm. information our his the history is always shifting mm. true the objective reality was the case 
we just didn't know it. The history was right. distorted. Yeah. Yeah. But but you know um, a theme that you deal with in your work is um, is violence and masculinity and um, some of the I'm thinking of some of the things that you didn't show in the slides that I found very uh, powerful. Uh, going back to GI Joes and how little boys are socialized with GI Joes and your um, experience some years ago with your cousin's death, which stimulated you to want to look at issues of masculinity. And so here in Chicago, you know, many of us are, you know, experiencing and wrestling with a kind of gut-wrenching reality of, of the death of many young black people. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering what the process of doing the work that you did branded and the particular images of your cousin's funeral um, where you, you had a political and an economic analysis, right, of the violence mm -hmm. that was being, um, you know, yeah. perpetuated. Well, I, th I, I grew up in, in New York in, in the 80s and 90s and then I uh, was in D.C. also. And my cousin who was murdered when he was 27, we used to always joke about when, we, when he was four years older than me, when we turned 21, we felt like that was an accomplishment, even being you know, relatively you know, middle class or lower middle class African American kids who, and he went to private school most of his life. We still saw that as, 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 as like kind of, we were both amazed by that. And um, when my cousin, when he was murdered, he was like, in, he went to a club in Philadelphia. He was he, um, on hip hop night. Him and his friends were leaving. The guys that he, he was with were uh, wearing like gold and platinum chains. They were um, robbed for the chains, and uh, the killers made my cousin lay down in the snow, and they shot him in the back of the head. Uh, they, he didn't have anything that they wanted, he, uh, even the $20 in his pocket. Um, and one of our roommates at the time um, said that the worst part about it, knowing that Sangha was killed and filled the over chain, was that we don't have to ask whether or not the killers were black, just because the stories that we are very comfortable with hearing are that black people kill each other over insignificant things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, not, I don't know if there's anything worth killing someone over, but that's, uh, and even in the process of, of uh, so basically when the killers were found, it was, f um, they were found because they went to the same club on, this, on, on the same Tuesday night. Two months later, they were stomping somebody else out for a chain. They were shooting into the crowd and killed someone else. And it was three African-American youth and one Puerto Rican youth. And um, the, they got, one got put on death row and three of them were life in prison. Um, and it started with somebody saying, I want to go get a chain. Mm -hmm. It's something as, as stupid as that. Um, and the chain was sold on the street for $400. Mm -hmm. And then we were in the funeral home and there's like, my cousin's on this table and I hear the conversation about, well, we have to get him a new suit, my aunt and my mom and everyone, they're like, oh, we have to do this. And then there's the caskets and there's one for like $5,000 and one's for $7,000 and one's for $2,000 and there's this unspoken thing that you love them more if you buy the like $7,000 casket and you maybe couldn't afford to love them enough if you buy the $2,000. Um, and it was just the absurdity of how commodity circulates in these systems that even in mourning you're, mm -hmm. you're still being marketed to. Um, and, and the fact that my cousin was killed over chain by people whose ancestors were likely brought here in chains um, is kind of this irony that I couldn't, um, I couldn't avoid dealing yeah. with in my work. Yeah, yeah. I was really impressed by, and I don't know if this is what you were trying to say or what I wanted to hear, but the, basically the political economy of black violence. Um, and I think so often I get frustrated that um, we want to make it as if it's an isolated incident. This kid was a bad kid. He killed this kid. This kid was a bad kid. He was in a gang. But when you, um, you did this powerful photograph at the funeral and then you, you, you illustrated what you've just described, you know, that the suit cost this amount and this cost this amount and then there's a little MasterCard down it. But, but you mentioned in another interview that you, were, you had read the book by uh, Walter Le, Lefebvre uh, about um, Michael, Jack, Michael Jordan, could have been Michael Jackson, mm -hmm. Michael Jordan and global capitalism. This, this branding and this advertising industry that seduces us and particularly young people uh, into thinking that a gold chain is something worth killing for or as was popular, you know, Nike shoes mm -hmm. or gym shoes. 
Um, yeah. yeah. And I, I think I actually learn more about my art from other people than I do from myself. So a lot of stuff you just heard, somebody else told me that. I just, you know, it's like, yeah, that's what I was thinking. I think that's the beauty of working as an artist is that, like, a lot of times I, I say that our job is to ask questions. Mm -hmm. uh, where and, and frequently the audience gives you the answer, mm -hmm. and so um, that's so when you make work that's political, sometimes people feel like oh it's a one-liner or it's too obvious, and I've always tried to make my work to be like a a, a line and a half, mm -hmm. like s make a statement and start a new one, and and and, and learn from the variety of ways that people interpret it. So. Mm -hmm. And it, your art also speaks to lots of different situations. And I think, it, well, the piece that you alluded to, and that's on the poster of the hands held high of men. And of course, I recognize there's a similar photograph that um, his Bernard Magubani did uh, mm -hmm. a long time ago mm -hmm. with South African miners being strip searched. But of course, we, you know, you did it in 2013. I thought of Mike Brown immediately mm -hmm. and the protest, you know, hands up, don't shoot. Mm -hmm. This sort of vulnerability in all those different contexts and the anonymous figures that could have been, you know, South African miners or kids on the street, you know, and with police violence. I wanted to ask you another theme you didn't mention, but I saw it in, in um, image after image is hands, um, hands on a barbed wire fence, hands reaching for each other, um, hands up. What is that? A conscious, I mean, the symbol of hands, I can think of how, what my interpretation, what I read into it, right? You know, hands work, hands struggle, hands worship. Um, yeah. I, but what I'm do you think? I'm curious what you think. Well, that's because, right. uh, that's really, because it's new, and I've been, like, I noticed it, like, like, maybe even last week, I was like, huh, there's a lot of arms, a lot of hands. Um, so what is it that you? Well, I think of sort of, yeah, well, I'm not an art critic, but, you know, I think of, um, I guess I sort of think of common humanity because hands are a little bit anonymous. Um, you can't necessarily tell the race or the gender or even sometimes the age uh, of hands. And, and they're so fundamental to everything we do together in particular, you know, whether it's struggle or try to break free or, or mm -hmm. hope or whatever. So I don't know. I just I saw a kind of common humanity in all the hands. And I didn't, when you mentioned um, the Holocaust and this was a image of concentration camp, that's, that wasn't what I. Because it could have been it could Palestine. Have been, it could have been Palestine. It could have been mm -hmm. a lot of places, yeah. Mm -hmm. It could have been the US-Mexican border. Um, right. And yeah, I, I was on the plane today. I don't know why. It's not deep. But it, did, it occurred to me as like hands, well, you know, if pretty much everyone has one. <laughs> and, and, and I thought about that, that kind of, it is, there is this universal element to it that you can right. I identify with. And, and what, what I love about Michael Jordan is that he created a version of a black male identity that everyone could, could relate to. And same with Michael Jordan, mm -hmm. Michael Jackson, mm -hmm. even if it was a white female, black male identity. <laughs> um, but the, the, there is this way in which I think um, I struggle, and my issue with black male identity is that when I see, especially when I was younger, having gone to like all black high school and certain situations and also being in New York, there was this idea that as soon as you saw a young, another young black male that you were a threat to them, they were a threat to you. Mm -hmm. And people would also see me as a threat. And I hated the fact that, that just by my existence, I was, my life was in danger because people thought I was a threat. And I think what I'm really dealing with trying to start to figure out how to deal with, with the work is to really, t and with Question Bridge, and showing that there are a million ways to be a black, a billion, because, you know, well, what is a black man, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, and how can, you know, we start to realize that it's just a person. Mm -hmm. And every person has so many facets, and every person is equally as valuable as the next. And the fact that African American men kill each other almost well, six or six times more likely to be murdered than the majority population, and 94% of them like are, are killed by other black males. Shows that we actually have kind of bought into the the lies about who we and each other are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and I think we have to surround all that, though, with, which I think, at least I read into what you do, a, a kind of political economy. I mean, it's not simply black people killing other black people because they hate black people. It's because of a certain political and economic reality that people are experiencing through which viol violence mediates that 
experience in certain kinds of ways, I think, that is bigger than the individual No, I think, I think you're right, for sure. And, but I think, you know, but what I, what I recognize is that um, what, I, I, what I'm trying to contend with is the humanity of it. Mm -hmm. Just that, that, that you can put an economic conversation around it, but it's really when people do harm to other people, um, they're doing harm to themselves and to the rest of us. Mm -hmm. And how do we stop creating boundaries, whether it be geographic boundary or religious boundary or economic boundary or skin complexion boundary, um, and start to, to recognize that the harm I do to you is, is the harm that I do to myself. And it's hard to like kind of tra translate. Um, and, you know, and it goes back to these cliches that we're very used to, like we're all in the same gang and you know, um, can't we all just get along? <laughs> but, <laughs> so, uh, but, but how do we actually live that reality is, is something I'm, I'm searching for. Mm -hmm. in, your, in your talk, you talked about the kind of, um, the way that race travels and the artificiality of race on a certain level or, you know, the social construction of race, I would say. Um, but I would sort of resist this idea that we're post-racial, and maybe you would too. Um, but how do we add another layer to that and also talk about um, racialized gender? And, that, and when I saw Question Bridge, men talking to each other about what it meant to be men, I guess I would ask you, how, what do you think the role of women, particularly black women, are in the definition, the construction, um, and perhaps the reconstruction of black masculinity? Oh, well, I was formed by yes. a black woman. Yes, um, But um, for me, I, I really don't believe Question Bridge is about black men. I think it's about people. What happens when people are put into groups, how they relate to the notion of the group itself, how they, how they navigate life, understanding that they're part of a group that they may or may not see themselves as having anything in alignment with. Um, and, and I think that is a universal story, which is kind of why the Truth Booth, that last project I showed, is kind of a continuation of that, because it, it really echoes that very same thing, that it's my unique perspective, and that cannot be grafted onto someone else, and it cannot be taken away from me. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I think about racialized gender, I, I do think gender is also as we, as, especially as we're moving further into the 21st century, we're recognizing the limits, or we're creating new limits and new boundaries of gender. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that's something that all of us are, are, are coming to terms with, getting used to, and also like watching like, what's going to happen next? And, I, and so I just as, so I think when we say black, the fact that for me, what really bothers me when I look at like the elections and like they say, you know, white men, um, didn't Obama lost the white male vote? Like unless they had this level of education, and they lived here, and then like they, they keep going like all of these different. It's like did he lose the white male vote, or did certain people vote for him and certain people not? Because you can split split the pie any number of ways. Mm -hmm. And similarly, like with when we talk about black men killing each other, like you said, it could you can probably split the pie based off of economic levels and yes. see the you know, poor people kill each other at this alarming rate. And so that's why I, when I think about the, the, this idea of the truth, mm -hmm. it's really the, the truth we choose to focus on. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so um, the ultimate success for me with Question Bridge is when people, when black men stop being black men and start being people. Mm -hmm. So when we see the conversation, when the police officer sees, I was, had this experience recently, I was at Burning Man, which I was very judgmental about <laughs> until I was there. But while I was there, a cop, like a real cop with a gun and a taser, walked up to me, <laughs> hugged me, and said, I love you, bro. <laughs> this is a cop. Uh -huh. And that was a transformative experience for me because yeah. I was like, does he just you? see me as a person? Because he was like doing it to everybody. He was a white cop. Yeah. Mm. And I saw him as a white cop. Mm. You know, so uh, you know, the fact that I couldn't even see him. Yeah. And, that, and then these are the experiences that um, I'm hoping that we continue to move toward. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, the idea of seeing oneself as not just a black man is contingent upon the world not seeing black men through a narrow lens, which unfortunately is still. Except for in the case of Gordon Parks. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, Gordon Parks didn't see himself in that way. My father hasn't seen himself that way. I think there's a whole lot of, I think, Afri Jim Brown. There's a lot of African-American men who 
uh, and who acknowledged that that's how other people saw them, but chose to live their entire lives, like, that's your problem. And I think um, th that's the, uh, that's the, the thing that I, I've kind of really trying to, to, to use as a pathway towards my own freedom is recognizing that like I, I can take on the chains that people put on to me, but I can also, you know, put them down. Mm -hmm. Were there um, openly gay black men in your uh, in the question bridge? Yeah, there was. Mm -hmm. um, there were in in the um, there's. I mean, I don't want to put numbers, but the, 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 I was that a funny thing is that like. Because we couldn't ask or answer any questions right. as part of the, we were just facilitating the conversation and we couldn't say, hey, are you gay? Uh -huh. And you know, when we talk about gay, are we talking about someone who's effeminate? You know, or are we talking about someone, and like, that was a really fascinating thing. And then when we went to prison and there were, because we, we did basically, we went to San Francisco, we were like, we need to find people who might put some of these questions into the, the conversation. But then we went to the jail and we'd expect to have like all of these homophobic responses from men in jail because they're like tough and so many of the response like we struggled to find anyone to give a, like a flat out homophobic response and, and we went to like eight different cities <laughs> but you'll be happy to know we found some homophobic people in chicago uh -huh. <laughs> some openly homophobic people <laughs> but it was so but it was really fascinating to be like wow like because there's all this stuff about black men and homosexuality and be this but, but like one of the people that I remember the most is this guy, and in, 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 um, he, he was uh, someone asked why there was so much fear and hate pointed towards homosexual men, um, and we showed a guy in prison that question, and he was scary, like really scary, and he was like big, and like he'd been in prison, like I've been in prison 17 times. I'm 40 years old. I've been in prison, prison 17 times. And he's just like, you know, uh, scary. And, and he's just like, he's like, but in that same statement, he's like, some of the toughest dudes I know are gay. He's like, I got no problem with gay people. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay. <laughs> and so he framed it on that, like, yeah. you know, and so, and that was just fascinating for me to, to, to witness that. But there were people responding to or, or talking about gay people or, or, or queer folks, but not saying themselves or outing themselves in some way. Is that? There was, no, there were people, like one person he responded, I can't remember what the specific question was, but his, one of his, he's, he outed himself in a different way. He was like, I'm a gay black male and my partner is a gay black male who's a Republican. Oh. <laughs> And he's like, that's and that's, out. he's like, for me, that's a coming out that I love, I can love a black gay Republican. Uh -huh. So there's, I mean, but that's the whole point. The qua <laughs> like, you can put any, that, if you look at the tag, the tags of people, there's thousands of tags that people have identified themselves by. And, and it's really how they define, our project was really about, like, not how I or society defines you, it's like how you define yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's why we couldn't say, and also it's self identified black males because, you know, we can't look at somebody and say they're a black male, sure, and sure, like, sure. especially like we go places, people are like, he's not a black male. It's like, well, he told us he was, you know, and that's right. that's really important for us to recognize that how we identify ourselves is is essential. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you one last question, and then I'm going to open it up to folks. And it's really coming back to my introduction and and my read of of how you describe your work. You talk a lot about collaboration. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times um, artists, and maybe this is my narrow view or, or, or ear, but artists, you know, talk about the singularity of their work, and you know, it's it's deeply personal. It's it's mine, and it's my statement to the world. But you really hold up, and and I think you commented that you learned so much through your collaboration with others, sort of giving up that singular authorship and entering into an artistic project with other people. Um, so can you say a little bit about collaboration in your work? Yeah, uh, for me, I think my need to collaborate is because left to my own devices, I'm trapped in this discourse about slavery, segregation, race, racism, black male identity. That, like there's this weight of me feeling like this need to deal with that. Mm. But then when my collaborator is a first generation Bulgarian American, it's just like, He's like, he can't, even, yeah. <laughs> he can't even begin to relate to that conversation. And it just changes things. Or even with the, our, the person who, who created the original Question Bridge project, he's a black male, 65-year-old African-American male who never experienced racism. Hmm. Like, he, we went to Alabama. He was like, I want to feel it. 
Like he was like, can we, can we find, you think we'll find some racist? A 65 year old black man at the time. And me and, me and Baite, another client was like, how do you? He grew up in, he grew up in, in Brooklyn and then he, moved to, then he moved to San Francisco. But he's just like, I just never felt it. Hmm. Um, and so, so, but also, so I realized that, like, again, that, that, that's why I'm like, this black experiences are different. Yeah. Um, um, but that's what I love. If it's, it's, if it's a white female or if it's a, um, a multi ethnic person, that, uh, a lot of my collaborators, each one of them forces me to see myself as part of a bigger picture. And I think in trying to make work that's relevant to, to, to more than just yourself. Mm -hmm. And also, I don't want to be defined. I am more than that conversation about black male and black male experiences. And so uh, as uh, when I collaborate, it starts to open the, it, myself up to these other sides of myself. So I don't just acknowledge the side that I think society sees. And I think um, just like when a corporation does something horrible, like it's a, it's a we, not a me. That, there's a lot of power in that we, mm -hmm. because you can't point to one single person. Right. Um, and that, and, and, and that's what I'm really interested in, how like, the, the collective voice of us really complicates the statement that we make. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, that's true in your art. It's true in politics. It's true in trying to change the world. Um, questions. I think we might have a floating mic for people who want to ask some. How many people have taken her class, I'd like to know? That's my question. I have they don't want to fess up. But what, I do have students in the room. What class was it? Uh, this is my class now. This is my first class with our just uh, African American history before 1870, I believe. Oh, wow. So dealing with issues of. <laughs> Put you on the spot. Dealing with issues of uh, the Middle Passage and um, beginning from there in the diaspora. Um, Actually He's one it. of my students who <laughs> knows all the stuff that we're going over anyway. So <laughs> that was my favorite. I took a class with Robin Kelly. Yeah, Same class. That was my favorite. Mine. Yeah. Um, Do you have a question, Danny? I did. Good. Convenient. You have the mic. But I have to remember it. Okay. I'm a little starstruck right now, so I'm going to think about <laughs> okay. my. Okay. Um, all right. Anthony will facilitate <laughs> the floating mic <laughs> until you. Thank you. There are a couple over there, Olivia Fahim. Hi. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and I work with Barbara, and I've learned an immense amount from her, although I haven't taken a formal class. Um, and my question is about internalized racism, internalized oppression, and internalized anti-black racism, and um, just whether or not you've dealt with that in your work at all. Um, and particularly, I'm thinking about um, your reference to identity categories and shifting identity categories as um, what, what I'm interpreting as um, an avenue for social transformation, perhaps. Um, but I'm just I'm just wondering if you've explored internalized racism at all. How would you define internalized racism? Well, the idea for one, um, and we talked about this um, at the Ella Baker Institute this summer, but the idea that to focus solely on blackness, on black people, on black history, as though that's taking up too much space or that that's somehow um, a problem or that we're taking away from um, folks of other identities. Well, I think I have strong provocative feelings about these things. Um, First of all, I believe if I, I think if you believe in race, you're a racist, because race was not created for anybody but a certain. Well, back then it was created for a very narrow group of, of Europeans, but it's, it's spread to a much broader group of Europeans. Um, and so, like any time I say I think about race or talk about things along race, I'm speaking about a system which black people are at the bottom and white people are at the top, and everyone else is a little bit kind of on their way f to the bottom. And so I really struggle with defining myself based off of racial categories that don't, don't, don't serve me. And then also that black history is, there's no such thing as black history. I think it's just history. And when we segregate the problem, we've had to create a black history because our history was not incorporated into the, the, the general narrative, except for a few exceptional places that mostly didn't help us either. And so for me, who's got a degree in Africana studies and my mother's, I grew up at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Um, and then when I moved to California, 
and African Americans are like, you know, you have kind of European descended people, then you have like the indigenous, we have Mexicans and, and mestizo people, then you have like Asian, recent Asian immigrants and, and Asian Americans, then you have like Pacific Islanders, and then you have black people. And my whole shift as far as like my understanding of my relevance, because I thought everything was about black and white, maybe a little bit of Latina. And now, and then I had to be like, wait, our story is just not the, the you know, we were the prodigal sons of, of American oppression. And then all of a sudden I had to learn about, you know, all of these things that happened to, to Filipinos, to, Chi to Chinese, to Japanese, to, um, to, to Tongans and to, to um, to, to obviously to many Latinos, and it was like, oh, this is a whole, this is a human story. Like, we, no one has the market cornered on both ex success and, and, and overcoming oppression and also being oppressed. And so that's, so my struggle with internalized racism is the whole notion of race. I have to, I have to probably add a footnote to that, which is to say, you know, I, and one of the things I'm showing in Danny's class next, the class my student is in, um, is a film documentary called Race, the Power of an Illusion, yeah. which kind of documents some of what you're saying. But I think there is, um, I mean, for me at least, and maybe we differ in this regard, um, race is real. It is not scientific. It is not ahistorical. And sometimes people think it's ahistorical. So people get racialized. So in Nazi Germany, the Jews were racialized. So they were um, ascribed certain characteristics as if it were innate in their genes. It wasn't. It wasn't, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, and in South Africa, my first trip to South Africa, people said, you know, and I'm 57, so, mm -hmm. to, so we fought to be called black, so to mm -hmm. call me colored was an insult. But of course, the, in that context, race and the racial taxonomy meant something very different. It was still real. So to sort of say it's unscientific, that it's historical, it changes over time, um, it's man-made, to me is not to say it's any less real as a social construct. So, you know, and I think we all transcend to affirm our humanity under slavery, under Jim Crow and all these contexts, you know, our ancestors uh, pushed against the inhumanity of racial designations at the same time acknowledging that the world has created these boxes and that there's consequences for them. So we can't just wish it away, right? We have to understand and dissect it, and then I believe fight could, to abolish. I believe we could wish it away. Oh well. And, um, and, and but but and, and because the, and the example that you show me is is exactly the same experience I had of recognizing when I went to South Africa and I was like, I thought I was black, and then I went to these all these colored. I went to yeah. a place where there's all these colored guys that look like me, and I was like, wait, I, the fact that depending on where you are, your racial definition changes, and as we move into a global society, that's where I think we start to realize that the, how race doesn't, there's no real value. The, the value that used to exist as within it, especially as we've, you know, again, with my, these are my struggles. I've gone all over the world as a black man, tried to like carry, sometimes like even in Cuba, tried to perform blackness. You know, and been told by white people I wasn't black enough, and other black people agree with them. <laughs> and so, and I'm and trying to really figure out like who I am if this thing that is real never seems to fit me, except for when I need to win an argument. Yeah. Um, and so that that so so to me, there's this 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 thing of like if if me being black is not the same here as it is in South Africa as as it is in yeah. Cambodia. But that's what it's always been. It's been static. It's been contextual. It's been because it's socially constructed. So when you have a different social milieu, it, that same phenotype means something different, which is, I mean, a really important point. It's not organic. It's not in our genes. It's not any of that. It's manufactured. And it gets manufactured differently in different places. But it's a social construct that can kill you in certain places. But it can right? also save you. And like, for instance, when we see, look at most of these universities where we see Ghanaians, Nigerians, Angolans, South Africans, who come here without the same racial awareness of like what their limitations are, they succeed in ways that most African Americans haven't succeeded in generations. Mm -hmm. Because they're like, oh, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to be here. And, and whereas I walk in there being like, I can't believe I'm the only one in here. How does that, you know, and, and that, that, so that's where I, when I'm talking about these avenues towards freedom, it's about recognizing that my perspective is just my perspective. And I could, 
choose to recognize that there's many other perspectives that would allow me to say, okay, I can, I, if I, that's what I believe about wishing, like, literally, I've had Africans tell me, like, we don't want your issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and of course, the legacy of colonialism in the continent and most of the Ghanaians and Angolans and, you know, Mozambicans who will never get here precisely because of colonialism and yeah, they, they have, in this country yeah. Yeah, is another. They, they, they've said, someone told me, like, we have circumstances, you got issues. <laughs> and so they recognize the circumstances that created their situation, but they feel like we've internalized yeah. the problems of ours. Yeah. I mean, your mapping of it, I think our, our analysis is a little bit different. I mean, the mapping and the examples you give are exactly examples that I give to illustrate the social construction of race in different, in different places, right? Um, and that it can be undone. But it's a matter of, um, a, I think, a political intervention uh, rather than, say, just a psychological one. I but, think you're right. I think you're right. Yeah. But I also recognize independently of that that there's also there's a job within each of us mm -hmm. to, to every day remind ourselves that we're not, that we are who we are and yes. who we want to be, yes. not who society that, says we are. I agree. So I feel like there's, there's two angles to it, but I got to read There's a dialectic of how that interacts, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, I, I know I said I would. <laughs> I forgot you all were here. No. <laughs> a couple more questions and, yeah. And now I'm back. Okay, um, good. In continuation of this conversation, I thought it was really interesting that you brought up characters such as, I should say characters, people such as Gordon Parks and your father. Um, and recently there was an interview with uh, the musician Pharrell Williams with uh, Oprah Winfrey, and he made this statement about being a part of the new black, which kind of made this uh, echo to post-black thinking or post-racialized uh, post society. And um, hearing you uh, say that there's at least an attempt to navigate the world without being tied to some construction of what a black identity is, um, and I'm assuming that you're you're constructing a, an identity for yourself. Does that identi identity uh, separate itself from blackness to create this individual thing? Um, and how do you account for things that not necessarily don't have a title um, as black or white, but are cultural retentions from a place that connects a body of people, if you call it black or not, if you were to call it maroon, they would still have those same cultural retentions, or as we call Africanisms, um, that unify people despite an oppressing term um, or a uh, categorization. Um, if you to take all those things away, there's still these unifying element, elements that uh, bring a certain group together. So how do you reconcile um, your work on things such as, you know, subjects such as slavery as well as moving throughout the world without that identity? I would never move throughout the world without the identification, but I would say that it's just like, a, like it's there. What I'm saying is I'm black, I'm male, I'm American, I'm here, I'm alive, uh, I'm straight, I'm gay, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm an artist, I'm an idiot, <laughs> I'm all of these things, and you can, I, I, I am all of that. You know, and, and that's, and what you, if, if the only thing that you choose to see, the, you know, the first two things you prioritize are that I'm black and male, you're probably not gonna see the other billion things that me, are me. And that's what I'm saying, there, there are as many things, and if you, and there are people here who, are, um, who, I, who I recognize that like, as I went to, I haven't probably not traveled as much as you have, but in different places, even within certain African countries, but even Africa, but if you go f from country to country, people don't look alike, they don't think alike, they don't act alike, they don't believe they have anything in common with those other people. And so when we talk about Africanisms and we think about you know, how people behave and relate to people in Sudan versus how they behave and relate to people in what we know as uh, Burkina Faso, what do those people, like that's, a, that, I believe that's a, that's a myth, I mean, because we don't, I mean, because people there, if you look, if you look at, okay, how about northern Algerians okay. and Tanzanians? Right. Like, you can, I mean, there's anywhere you can go, you, you know, we say Africa, we meet, we want to believe is a uniform thing, and Africa is 700 to 900 million different things that are changing. 
is, is, is what I'm saying. Yeah, and we're going we're gonna to move to another question. Though. We're going to talk after this. We had a long question. Yeah. I'm going to lose. The last question, yeah. Can I ask you to talk about Ellen Baker, though? When now? Yeah. My, uh, my question basically is, um, this wasn't touched upon in your practice that you're also a curator. And how does that practice inform your work as an artist? Well, I think I just want to have opportunities to start conversations. So if I call myself a curator, I'm a curator. But it's just really just, when I say people, I say I'm an artist, people um, say, OK, what's your medium? And I, my standard answer is anything I can get away with calling art. <laughs> so I'm sorry you've been looking at the back of my head. Do you see my ball spot um, the whole time? But um, there is that, that. That's the bottom line, that my voice is nowhere near as important as your voice or your voice. And the more, and what we've learned through the internet is that teenagers can have as much influence as heads of state. And it's really about us using our voices. And, and I was hoping that you'd talk a little bit about uh, why you wrote about and worked, um, did so much work about Ella Baker. And also, when I think about history, <laughs> how, how, her, how her legacy in history is, is, so, and when I, is, is kind of eclipsed by Rosa Parks and, and Coretta Scott King, maybe Fannie, Fannie Lou Hamer. Like, how is it, what I, what I feel cheated by in histories are, how you know other figures are just like, kind of ignored because they don't fit into the narrative that we that we're used to. Mm -hmm. Anthony's going just, like just, this just to this me. One. No, I mean, I, I don't know how to smoothly segue to except to think back to your mother's work. I met your mother actually um, many years ago when I was doing work at a museum. But um, that her the project of unearthing, you know, the 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 lives were real. The people made an impact on history is just in remembering in a selective amnesia that we have about history, certain people get left out, certain stories and narratives get left out. Doesn't mean that they didn't impact the time in which they lived. And that was the case with both the people I wrote about, Ella Baker, who was critical in the what we call the black freedom struggle, but um, making a lot of connections and transcending the kind of categories that you're talking about. I mean, she was a woman in very uh, predominantly male leadership circles. She allied North and South. She allied people across generational divides and had a very unique you know, style of leadership, which was non-self-promoting and very group-centered. And then Aslanda Robeson, similarly, who was very much an internationalist, who really did redefine um, for herself what it meant to be. I mean, she totally defied in the way that you're talking about the men that you mentioned uh, did the category of what it meant to be a black woman in the early 20th century, you know, traveling all over the world and, you know, writing and being a correspondent at the United Nations and, you know, and standing up to McCarthyism in this country. And we have new forms of that today that we need to stand up to. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I found it, um, I guess, you know, when maybe, you know, artists doing work that part of the narrative is autobiographical or the kind of personal things that you work through. And I think my own work in terms of biography is thinking about trying to make meaning of certain aspects of my own life, particularly uh, being a feminist, being a radical, being an activist, um, and being a writer. And so looking at other women's lives at different points in time, what did, what did those roles and labels mean to them? And invariably, they were different things. So anyway. That's my short spiel about, about my work. But it's been wonderful having this conversation with you. Um, and I, maybe we can have a follow-up conversation yeah, and flesh out some of these things. I thought your work was just very powerful, made me think, made me feel, um, made me ask more questions. So thank you. Thank and, you. And I want to say, the benefit of being an artist is you don't have to have footnotes. <laughs> and that's what I'm saying. <laughs> they made up race. I can make up whatever else I want to make up. <laughs> and that's the beauty of it, uh, of, of, of the story. And I think I want to thank you for, 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 for the work that you've done and the work that you're doing. Because if it wasn't for, like you said, your peer, Robin Kelly, I wouldn't be, even though with, with my mom, I wouldn't be doing the work that I'm doing. Because um, you need teachers. You need professors that like break your, 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 your thinking. 
and I, I was mad I got into black, <laughs> black history before 1870. I was like, this is horrible. Yeah. <laughs> but there was so much more to learn there than you know, the narrative that I, you know, I, I knew from afterwards. So yeah. thank you, yeah. thank you for taking the time. Well, and tonight. I think artists, artists teach us all the time too. I mean, my daughter is a poet and I'm always learning oh, things that I couldn't learn from historians. So you know, oh, great. It's, it's reciprocal. Thank so you. So thank you, join me. Thank you, Anthony.